Henry, you were 10 years old when Hitler and the Nazis came to power in 1933. Before we turn to those years and the war and the Holocaust, tell us first what you can about your family and yourself <coughs> before the Nazis took control <coughs> in 1933. Well, we lived, we lived in a small town not far from Stuttgart. And my parents were very friendly with the, uh, with the uh, family over there. And the husband of the family, uh, his name was Mr. Kindler. He was the owner of a toy factory. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> my brother, who was uh, two years younger than I was, and I, we, got, we had a lot of fun with all the presents we got from the toy factory because that was very, very convenient for us and wonderful. My parents were very friendly with the family. They went, uh, they went skiing with them and on, uh, they, went, they went skiing and, and, and played tennis. And they were friend, and on Sunday mornings, my father and Mr. Kidler they used to get together in a in a restaurant. And the the uh, in fact, my father once suggested to Mr. Kidler that he should join the party, the art Nazi party, because he said in order to stay well, you have to do that. However, oh, they also went to a mask ball uh, on. On, uh, on Halloween. Uh, they had two, two daughters, and my, my, bro my brother and I are about the same age, and we played together. They had a real, uh, they were cooking and, and baking and doing all sorts of things. This was very nice. Henry, you, um, you, d you wrote in your memoir, you've written a memoir, and you wrote in it, during those years, my parents lived a normal, healthy life. Absolutely. Yep. Just like, like we do here, too, in the United States. There was no difference at all, whether we were Jewish or, or, or Christian or whatever. Mm -hmm. It was all the same, and we were very friendly. We were observant Jewish, but otherwise we were just about the same. As I mentioned earlier, your father fought for Germany in the First World War. What do you know about his experience? Well, <clears throat> he was 19 years old. He was drafted. And his mother went with him to the draft board, hoping that, hoping that uh, he wouldn't be sent away too far. So she put in a word for him because he was the only one of the family who was left because her, uh, my, my father's father had already passed away and she was a widow. So to show the, uh, the sympathy of the officer, he didn't send, her, he didn't send my father just to next door to, to, the, uh, to the cavalry, which was a little while away. He told him that he has to be joining the Navy. And the Navy had to serve for four years rather than three or two and that was the the kindness of the of the, of the german supervisor thanks sir uh, so my father uh, was in the navy for altogether he was in the in the navy in the army for seven years the war was four years and he had another three years of service until the end, of, until the war ended, and he got the Iron Cross, which is a very good uh, very recognition. Unfortunately, and, and unfortunately, he got that because he was under the impression that nothing could happen to him. As it turned out, in the end, it didn't help at all. Henry, in 1930, your family moved to Stuttgart, and you attended the Waldorf School. What was, what was the Waldorf School? The Waldorf School, <clears throat> that was founded by an owner of a cigarette factory who uh, wanted his uh, employees, the children of the employees, to go to a school which was 
modern and which was up to date. And he engaged a philosopher from Austria by the name of Rudolf Steiner, who, uh, whose idea it was that boys and girls should be in the same class in, together. And in the first grade, the boys learn how to knit and to sew and to crush a hook. And the girls, the girls, of course, also learned that too. And then in the third grade, the girls learned how to do woodwork. And they also were, uh, had an opportunity to learn uh, gardening, as well as the boys did that too. So you see, it was a very progressive school. Mm -hmm. And as it turned out, the progressive school didn't exactly jive with the Nazi philosophy, where everything was controlled. And uh, consequently, eventually in 1938, the school had to, was closed and the teachers who were out of, out of a job had to look for a job, uh, had to find a job. Well, my class teacher's name was Ege, Karl Ege. The reason I mention that is because he'll come up later on. And, I, I'm, and we'll make sure that comes up later on. You bet. Your family, Henry, suffered a terrible tragedy in 1932 when your brother died. Yes, in 1932 my brother passed away. He passed away on account of, uh, uh, of uh, middle ear infection and, and, and so he, could, uh, he died. They didn't have any penicillin yet. Penicillin was uh, developed in 1927. However, it didn't get to the hospital where my brother used to be. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened. That was the first cal calamity which my parents had, and of course me too, but particularly my parents because they were very unlucky later on also. Henry, in 1933, of course, Hitler... In 1933, the Hitler, Hitler came to power. Mm -hmm. And my father at that time we lived in Stuttgart at that time, and my father uh, was the president, as you heard before, uh, of a cattle dealers association. And shortly after Hitler came to power, Nazis in their uniform walked into, into his office and told him, you're out. That's all there was to it. My father threw the keys on the floor and walked out. He had, there was nothing he could do about it because they were the power and that was it. So then eventually my father went to Israel, at, this time, at that time Palestine. And when he came back to find out how <coughs> living was at that time, and he, when he came back he said, <coughs> excuse me, that if we live here, the way we have to live in Palestine, we last a long time. Very unfortunately, he was dead wrong. Mm -hmm. So he thought things would still be better. St he thought things would be better staying in Germany. Well, that was the implication. What's more, he figured he had the eye on the cross, <coughs> and that would uh, save him or guard him. How did how did your father? How did your father support the family after he lost his job? Well, after that, he first he first uh, he first uh, got some clothing and and uh, he took over a, a, a not a clothing company but a, a, a retailer, and, uh, and that didn't last too long. And he had a partner who was experienced in that and. He double crossed him. The double. The <coughs> then he decided. Then he had an opportunity <coughs> to pick uh, to uh, to. Um, he had an opportunity to to uh, take over a plywood a plywood uh, dealership in Cologne. So we moved to Cologne. And uh, that's and another thing. In '38, all Jewish all Jewish children had to leave the schools in Germany. And uh, there was a Jewish school in in Cologne, and I was able to go there, and that that was good. I mean, it worked out well for me. And 
that's where we were at the time of uh, Kristallnacht. And, and before we talk about Kristallnacht, Henry, after Hitler came to power, your mother really wanted to emigrate, didn't she? Oh, my mother, right from the beginning, she said, let's get out of Germany. But my father was persistent. And at that time, women weren't as, <laughs> as uh, so what shall I say, uh, they weren't as, as powerful as, as they are today. <coughs> and uh, the women just did what the husband said. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. And consequently, although my mother insisted on it, she took all sorts of courses to be prepared to get her to another country, preferably the United States. She, she learned how to, uh, how to sew uh, ties and uh, shirts and make candies. I mean, she was very well prepared to come over here, but my father wouldn't budge. Mm -hmm. Well, and as you said, he was a decorated soldier and he thought that would protect He was a decorated soldier, he thought it would be yeah. okay. Yeah. Henry, you're, um, you, learned, you learned to blow glass and make neon tubes as a, as a youngster. Um, I, I was what? You learned to blow glass oh, yeah, and make that, neon tubes. Oh yeah, that's also something I learned. Yeah. While I was, uh, while we were in Cologne, the uh, superintendent of the, of the building, he, he knew how to blow glass and I learned that. And uh, it, ha it came in very handy later on. Which we will hear about, things. I hope, yes. Hmm? Which we will hear about, I hope, later. Yeah. You learned that skill. You, Chris Dahlnock, The Night of Broken Glass. Tell us what that was and what it meant for your family. Well, I didn't know what was going on. But a friend of mine who worked for a, for a baker, he came by around 7 o'clock or 6.30 in the morning and told me, don't go to school because there are all sorts of things going on which are not good. And... Uh, I stayed home that day, and that was a Thursday, and then Friday morning, and my father was home the following day, which was Saturday morning, and uh, two big fellows came to the, uh, to the house and uh, said, is your fa I opened the door, and he said, that was your father here. He said, so my father came out. And they said, come with me. That's all. So there were two police officers, not in uniform. They were in civil. And they took my father to the police station. However, on the way there, my father said, what would you have done if, if I hadn't been home? They said, well, I would have gone to your neighbor because he's also Jewish. And we all have to do is fill our quota. So that was the excuse for going to. <laughs> so you can imagine. What happened to your father after they took him away? Well, he was, he was away for about four weeks. And when he came back, he, he, he was in terrible shape. And he said, uh, if ever I go, if ever I get in there again, he was taken to Dachau, which you probably are familiar with. That's the concentration camp near Munich. And uh, when he came back, he said, if ever I get there again, I won't come out alive. Mm -hmm. And that was very true. Henry, on the night of Kristallnacht, that November 9th through 10th, hundreds of synagogues were burned across Germany. Well, but yours wasn't. Pardon? Your synagogue wasn't burned. No, because it was attached. I mean, the building was attached to other, to other buildings. And there they didn't, they didn't put it on fire because... Uh, they were afraid the fire would go to the next to the next building. However, it was ransacked, mm -hmm. terribly ransacked, and uh, it was a mess. What's more, my school was in the same compound. It wasn't connected to the synagogue, but it was in the same compound, a special building. It was a Jewish school, as I mentioned before, and. Uh, that's the way it worked, and, but we didn't do much learning anymore after that. <laughs> and in fact, soon, soon after Kristallnacht, your parents made the profound decision to well, send you I away. Well, I was very fortunate. My cousin was, wor uh, was working in, in, in London, or near London, 
and he had a girlfriend, and the girlfriend's father was a part owner of a clothing factory, and he persuaded the, that person, whose name was London, to uh, guarantee me, because I had to be guaranteed to get under the kinder transport. So one day we received a telegram, sent dates of Heinz uh, and his, his, uh, his address. I mean, the, the, uh, and my parents sent, it, sent my information, and I was lucky because it only went up to 17. I was 16 years old when I got that, that uh, telegram. So, on, a, on, on, on early, early uh, February 1939, <clears throat> my parents took me to the, to the railroad station. We said goodbye through the window, and they left the, the platform. However, when they, came, when they came to the street, they found out that the train had been delayed by, two hour, by half an hour. So they figured they'd spend a few more minutes with me. And the moment they came back, I knew I'm not going to see them again. Before that, I knew I would see them again. And, and about 10 minutes later, I saw them again, and that was it. And I never saw or heard of them again. Well, I, heard, I got some letters from them eventually in, in England. But otherwise, I didn't see them anymore, talk to them anymore. That was it. It was quite a shock, I can assure you. But I felt it, that this is it. Well, the train left eventually. We came to Holland. And after we had crossed the border, everybody was very relieved. And to indicate how relieved we were, I'd like to tell you a little story there. There was a, little, a girl, maybe 10 years old, she had a newspaper, an illustrated newspaper, and there was a picture of Hitler on it. The moment she was sure that we were in Holland and not in Germany anymore, she took the picture of Hitler and tore it into thousands of pieces. That's goes to show you how the emotions were when we got across the border. Mm -hmm. uh, and the next day, <coughs> we got to uh, we got on, to uh, on a ferry. I mean, the same night we got to the ferry. And we got to England, and the next day uh, we were taken by bus from Liverpool. No, not from Liverpool, but we, we, were t we came from, from, from the port. We were taken by bus to Liverpool Street Station in London. There was a big hall, <coughs> and everybody had big signs on their <coughs> front uh, with uh, not names but numbers on it. I knew a little English because we had learned a little bit in school, but the pronunciation was entirely different, mm -hmm. and it wasn't quite that easy. However, I saw a nice lady walking in, and I figured I'll try and help her. So I walked up to her and said, may I help you? And she pulled out a piece of paper and looked at it and said, mm, Heinz Kahn. <laughs> I had found my, my sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> so. My cousin came with a car, and we drove to their home. And the first thing, well, we had dinner. I met Mr. London and Georgina, the daughter. And Mrs. London, of course, I knew from the, from the place. And the first thing, we had some dinner, and we had uh, peas and, 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 and meat, I don't remember what. But the important thing is, the reason I mention it is because Mrs. Lutton was very concerned about me eating properly, the English way. Now, you know, in the United States, <coughs> you eat, you, you, you cut, your, you cut your, your food, you put it in the right hand and eat it in the United States. In Europe, you eat with your, you, you, cut your food, but you use your left hand to put it into your mouth. As far as peas are concerned, you just push them on the, on the fork. In England, you have to take the fork and, and, and spear it. So you get three or four pieces of peas on it and put it in your mouth. 
you don't get very much. But this, <laughs> this, is, the way you, this is the way you have to eat in England. I mean, supposedly, supposedly. Well, I had my own room, and uh, I, 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 and then Mr. London asked me, "Do you want, to, <coughs> do you want to go to school?" I said, "I would prefer to work." The reason I said that was because a, I had no money at all, and b, more importantly, I wanted to learn something. So when I get to the United States, which I had in in my mind all the time, I'd have something to to show that I would be able to earn some love living. Well, <clears throat> as it turned out, I was in a glorified prison, actually. Mr. London took me to work every morning, brought me back every after evening, and I had lunch with the staff, and that was it. I was getting bored with that. I mean, I learned how to make knots and how to put tags on the pants, but this is no profession. So I asked him, can I please work in the sewing on a sewing machine? In the, in, in, so of course that wasn't appropriate for the prodigy of the, of the factory owner to, to work with those common people. Uh, I mean, that was not right. Because he was no, the owner. No, I couldn't do it. He was the owner of the factory, mm -hmm. right? He was the he, owner, he was the exactly. Owner, yeah. The owner of the factory, his prodigy should work in the no, that didn't go. Well, I was rather disappointed, but things changed pretty soon. <clears throat> As I said, I arrived <coughs> in, in, in February, and in, in September. Henry, can I ask you one question before you go there? At some point, well, soon after you got there, you changed your name from Heinz. Oh, yeah, that was another thing. Uh, Mr. and uh, Mrs. London, or Mr. London, I don't know who, they said to me, well, <coughs> uh, Heinz is not really a good name, although there's Heinz uh, 50, 57 varieties, you know, the catch-up. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's not good. That's, that's, you have to change your name. So I figured, well, <coughs> a criminal that I read in books, not that, I mean, I was 16 years old. Uh, the criminals, they usually changed their names with the same initial. I w didn't want to do that. So consequently, I chose Peter. Peter is a name in English as well as in German. And consequently, it, it suited me. So I chose it. When my, ma when my mother heard about it, she said, I don't like this at all. But I guess if Mrs. Lutton wants it, then it has to be. I couldn't answer that, but it wasn't that way. <laughs> and, and Henry, of course, at that time, you were able to write to your parents, and they wrote to you in yes, that time. Yes, yes, that, that I could do. Yeah. The war hadn't started yet. And then, uh, of course, in September of 1939, the war begins. I know, I know. Well, this, this is another thing. Okay. In September 39, uh, the war broke out, and immediately Mr. London told me he's going to evacuate the family. And since I, w oh yeah, then I got a permit, uh, uh, he got a per uh, worker's permit from your apprentice permit, and I was getting one pound a week, which is 20 shillings. I said to him, don't give me that much, I live in your house and all that, I don't need that much money now. He said, oh, that's okay. 20 shillings, it's okay. I guess it was the law in England, but I didn't know. So the war broke out and the, the family evacuated. And he, Mr. London told me, since you're working, you have to look for a place. <clears throat> so I found a place, I mean, they lived in Hempstead Garden Summer, which is a really fancy neighborhood. They had their own private home, etc., etc. And it wasn't far from Hampstead Heath, which is a big meadow, where I went quite often and just uh, dreamt. I had no money, as I mentioned before, although I got a little bit there, a pound a week, and I saved it very conscientiously because I wanted to get to the United States, and I knew I needed money to do that. 
Well, after the war broke out and Mr. London told me I have to look for a place, I went to Finsbury Park. Now, Finsbury Park was a middle-class type of neighborhood. The county council school was not far away from where I lived. There was a synagogue not, for, not far from where I lived, so that was very convenient. And across the street, I met a fellow with whom I was friendly until he passed away a few years ago. His name was Lou. So now that I had to move, I said to Mr. Lund, now you, I like to work in the, in, the sew, in the sewing room. And this time he couldn't say no. Because, uh, you know, <laughs> but on the other hand, I also asked him to give me some more money. Oh, no, you can't, do, you can't have that because uh, other boys at your age don't get any more either. Now, it was different if you live with them for nothing or if you have to have your own room. What I had to pay was 14 shillings and sixpence per week out of your bed 20. and breakfast. Out of your 20. Hmm? Out of your 20 shillings. You had, you had to pay 14 shillings, shillings out of your 20 shillings. Yep. Yeah, out yep. of 20. Yep. So that wasn't exactly good either. So I had to get, to, so I learned how to sew. And after a short time, I figured I go into piecework. In other words, to pay for each piece which I complete. And there I was able to make 30 shillings, 50% more than what I had before. And that was already a little bit better. Henry, can I, um, can I jump in and read something uh, that you shared with me? During that time, you were called before a tribunal, and your record said, the holder of this certificate is to be exempted from further order from internment, because you were from Germany, and from the special restrictions applicable to enemy aliens, because you're from Germany, under the aliens order. And then they added, in late 1939, they added that you are a refugee from Nazi oppression. So that should have protected you. Okay. But when, well, this was a little later. There wasn't right, right after the war broke out because first there was very quiet and uh, nothing much happened. Although there was an air raid alarm, but there was false. Right after Mr. Chamberlain had declared war on Germany. After the war, Churchill had written five volumes, the Second World War, and in one of the volumes he showed how precarious the situation was in England. And the Brits didn't only get scared, they got panicky. And when they got panicky, then they decided to intern the lot, including <coughs> refugees from Nazi oppression. Now, I'd like to give you an idea what it was like by just reading a little excerpt what Winston Churchill had written at the time. <coughs> Between 1940 and 45, Winston Churchill had collected his memoranda, notes and letters and used these to write six volumes called the Second World War. And now I'm quoting, we could not regard the state of the outer oceans without uneasiness. We knew that disguised merchant ships in unknown numbers were preying on all southern waters. The enormous disproportion between the number of raiders and the forces the Admiralty had um, to employ to counter them and guard, <coughs> guard immense, the immense traffic that had been explained previously. The Admiralty had to be ready at many points and give protection to thousands of merchant vessels and could give no guarantee against occasional lament lamentable disasters. A far greater danger was added to these problems, the only thing that ever really frightened me, and that was Mr. Churchill saying that, was during the war was the U-boat peril. 
now our lifeline even across the broad oceans and especially the entrance to the island were endangered. How much would how much would the U boat warfare reduce our imports and shipping? Only the slow, cold drawings of lines and charts which showed potential strangulations. The high and faithful spirit of the people counted for naught. In the bleak domain, either the food, supplies and arms from the New World at the Empire arrived across the ocean or they failed. So now you see why they got panicky over there. In any case, this was after Dunkirk, where the British Expeditionary Force had been encircled by the Germans, and all 300,000 British soldiers and, and free French were able to get to, to England. However, all the equipment was lost, and you can imagine how, how the people felt. Of course, everything was rationed, and it was very, very very, very strongly rationed, and they had very little to eat. Henry, after, after the Nazis um, took the uh, France and uh, Holland and the Lowlands, um, you heard on the radio an announcement that aliens should report to the police. You heard that? Oh, on. yes. So what did that mean for you? <coughs> it was Winston, <coughs> Winston. and that's a two-day two holiday in England. And I decided since I hadn't seen much, I hadn't seen anything of England except going to, coming to work, I decided to go on a bicycle trip to, uh, to Oxford. And I got there, but everything was closed. So I went into a, uh, into a bed and breakfast place and, and slept there for one night. I wanted to, to me, the, a friend of mine who lived not far outside of Oxford, so that's what I did. That's what I came for. I slept in that, how, in that uh, boarding house for one night, and the next morning I heard on the radio, all, all aliens have to report to the police. So I asked the, uh, the landlady where the police station was. So. So she said, why? I, said, I told her. So she said to me, well, I thought you were Irish, uh, <laughs> but, but I wasn't. <laughs> and uh, I went to the police. <clears throat> I told them what, what the problem was, and they told me, I'd just go back, and uh, it'll be all right. OK, so I, went, I, I rode back, and <clears throat> Shortly thereafter, well, I, then I found out that a lot of acquaintances of mine were being interned, and I, I felt my turn, my turn is going to come also. So what I did, I took all the money which I had, I took it to the Bloomsbury House. The Bloomsbury House was the organization which was responsible for the kinder transport, for the kids and the kinder transport. And I told them, uh, this is all the money I have, Please get me out as fast as possible and get me a, uh, get me a ticket to get to the United States. So she told me, well, it isn't quite enough, but we'll make up the difference, which was great. Well, it turned out a little different. Uh, I went back. I insisted that I get a certificate from, my, from, my, from the company I worked for. The name of the company was London Brothers. And uh, I got the certificate after pushing. I came home. Sure enough, I just had gotten the certificate. I just came home. And the landlady told me, the police was here. You should come and take all your stuff with you and go tomorrow to the police station. Well, tomorrow I went to the police station with all my stuff. I have a suitcase. I was immediately interned. Now. That was the 3rd of July, 1940. We were, all the people who were in turn slept one night in a, in a race course outside of London, also in tent camps, of course. And then the next day we were given a big piece of cheese 
and put on a train. All day long we were on that train until we finally landed at Liverpool, a west coast uh, port in England. We were taken off and uh, <coughs> landed in a, in a camp, in a tent camp, which from the air looks like, like any army camp, of course, except there was barbed wire around it. Uh, <coughs> then we were told the week before Liverpool had been bombed and also that the Arundora Star, that's the name of a ship who had taken prisoners of war and into Nice to Canada, had been torpedoed and sunk. And after that news, we were asked, who wants to volunteer to be sent to an overseas dominion? I had no idea what an overseas dominion was. I figured if it's Canada, they would have said so. And uh, then I scratched my head and wondered, should I take a chance with a torpedo? Or shall I stay here and take a chance with the, with the Nazis coming over and bomb bombing us and all that? So I decided I'll take a chance with a torpedo. It wouldn't last too long. Well, I took a chance. And I decided, and so four, six, five days after I, we arrived in the camp, we were taken on HMT Dunera, which is a troop ship, and which, which provided uh, uh, facilities for 1,500 soldiers. However, the number of Indonesian prisoners for was tw over 2,500. So you can imagine the situation it was like. <clears throat> we got aboard a ship and uh, all our luggage was put on, on the center of the top deck and the canvas was put over it. I was in the bottom, uh, bottom uh, deck in the front of the ship. The ship left, uh, left the port the very same night and was pitching and rolling like crazy. And I didn't, know, I didn't think there was any storm, but I couldn't tell you. It had no way of looking out or anything like that. As it turned out, the ship tried to avoid uh, torpedoes. That's why they were pitching and rolling. A torpedo hit, made a dent into the ship, but did not explode. So, so you can imagine. Well, of course, I didn't know that immediately, but I found it out eventually. <clears throat> now, quickly, 22 years later, my wife, my two sons, and I met my former teacher from the Waldo School in New York. And after meeting him several times, he told me, you know, in 38, when we, let, when we were fired from the Waldo School, I got a job in a torpedo factory, and once in a while, I put sand into, into the mechanism. I said, what made you take such a chance? I wanted to play a trick on the Nazis. So, thank you, Mr. Eger. Mm -hmm. You know, Henry, our, our time is, is getting short, and there's, I know there's things you want to share with us, and there's some things I, I, I want to make sure you tell us. If you don't mind, you mentioned a few minutes ago that all your luggage was piled in the middle. Yeah. And, a, and, and that included the letters you had gotten from your parents. Oh, uh, yes. And so tell us what happened to the luggage. Well, <coughs> every day, <coughs> all of us went for a walk. We walk, walk, running on the deck, back and forth, machine gun on either side <coughs> to, put, to protect them. Uh, the canvas had been taken off and the soldiers helped themselves to whatever they wanted because these, these soldiers who were guarding us were not exactly the cream of the crop because they were needed in England. 
So they threw stuff overboard as much as possible. And it so happened that saved us too. Another torpedo boat was following us and the captain asked uh, to pick up some of the uh, debris which they had thrown overboard and there were German letters, so they left us alone. So that was another good incident. I mean, it was a criminal offense. They, they eventually got mar court martialed. At least the, the crew. The crew, was, yeah, the officers of your ship got the court officer, martialed. The officer who was in charge of the soldiers got court martialed after the war. And, and Henry, the ship, as I remember, the ship sailed towards Canada, got close to Canada, yes, and then, then reversed it itself. To, then, it went, then it went south <coughs> around the Cape of Good Hope <coughs> and landed after one and a half months in Sydney, Australia. We were taken off over there and taken 18 hours into the interior. After after having taken after having arrived in a new camp, it was brand new and the sand was blowing like crazy, and uh, we were sandblasted. We didn't. We wore shorts, and we felt the sand blowing against our legs. The next morning, out of 2,500, <coughs> 13 names were called out, and mine was the first one on that list. And when we got back, when we uh, we were called to, to the uh, orderly room and we were told we go back to, to Sydney. And somebody told us, uh, well, the soldiers talked, uh, these chaps are going back to England. Well, that was not our choice, but uh, that's, I had no control over it. Well, it took us one and a half, well, the ship left. Ten days later. Did, did you know why you were going back to England after all that journey? No, I didn't. You did not know, okay. I didn't know at all. So, after two weeks, I mean, it took us two, one and a half months to get to Australia. After two weeks, we were taking off the ship, the 13 of us, and uh, we were taken to the police station, and everyone was being interviewed by a police officer. And the fellow who asked me all sorts of stupid questions, the last question he asked, where do you live? I said, I don't even know where I am. And you asked me where I live? Well, he had to find out. And he found out that we're going to live in the Jewish Relief Association home in Bombay, India. So that's where we were. And the reason that happened was because the release which I had tried to organize before I was interned, came too late to stop me from being sent on the ship, put on the ship. But it reached me when I finally was in Australia, and that's how I got out. I lived in, in, in India until the end of the war and came to the States in 46. So, so when you left Australia, it was to go back to England, but instead they dropped you off in Bombay, India. Right. Well, the reason they did that because it was a troop ship and the troop ship had to uh, accommodate soldiers to go to the Middle East to fight. So they just dumped you off in India? And, and exactly. So what was it like to <laughs> just find yourself in India? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then you had to make a living and support yourself. You're living well, in India. Well, no, I didn't have to do that. The, the Jewish Relief Association, okay. they, they, they fed us and, and we lived there. Uh, four, four, of, uh, four, four of the boys, four of us boys, lived in one bedroom. And uh, it was quite an interesting experience, I can assure you. And uh, eventually I got a job, a night shift foreman, but there were lots of other stories in between, but that takes too long now. One, one I want you to tell us is, is that um, you, of course, once the war began, you had lost all contact with your parents. Oh, yes. I, I couldn't get anything. I only found out when I worked at the Holocaust Museum what happened to my, what probably happened to my parents. My father, I know, they kept very good records of it. But my mother, I have no idea. Actually, I do have an idea. She lived till 44 and was forced, marched 
uh, to, uh, to, to, to they, they uh, in turn enlarged speeches <coughs> in Poland. And they were, had a forced march going to, when the, when the uh, Russian troops came. They forced, the, the Germans forced the uh, internees, the prisoners, to, to go, to walk back towards Germany. But before they got to Germany, uh, that I found out from the Holocaust Museum, they were, uh, they stopped before they crossed the German border. They were forced to dig their own graves and then they were killed, shot. That was, that's what happened to my mother, most likely, and she was the one who was so orthodox, and uh, that made me turn somehow. Mm -hmm. Henry, um, if I remember correctly, at, at some point before your mother and father were sent to Lodge, they got word that you were okay from a friend of yours. Oh, yes. Well, in 35, I, uh, that was before all the problems. I, I was in a, in a summer home in Kreuznach, which is in Germany. And there I met a boy with whom I became very friendly. And I liked him very much and we were in constant touch. I met him again in the States, I met him in England, India, because he was a soldier by then and he was, he was sent to India. And while he, I met him, I met him for three days, he found out that his mother had died. So it's bad. But anyway, this boy, <coughs> when I came to India, <coughs> a gentleman in the home, he was leaving for the United States, and I asked him to contact my friend Eric, which he did. And Eric, on his own, wrote a letter to my parents to let them know that I'm okay, because they had completely lost touch with me because they do. I wasn't in England anymore, but they didn't know what had happened to me. So that's it. So they at least knew that you were, Pardon? they at least knew you were safe somewhere. That's right, yeah. that I was alive somewhere. You're that alive. they could, uh, yeah, that's right. So Henry, you would spend the rest of the war in India. Yes, until 46. But while I was in India, I met my, a friend of mine took me to to a sports club, to Maccabi Sports Club in, in Bombay. And there was a young lady who played ping pong, and I liked to play ping pong too, but she beat me almost all the time. So I had to get even, so I had to get even with her. So, what do you think I did? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but that took a long time, and was very difficult, because she was born in India, she, she, her, her forebears came, came from Europe too, but she was born in India and as such she didn't have a possibility of getting a visa to, get, to, to live here. So while I was in uniform, I went to the State Department and asked them, I learned in the, in the, in the Army, there are three ways of doing things, the right way, the wrong way, and the Army way. And the Army way is the way it goes. So I said to her, after we went through all the possibilities, I was not married, <coughs> I was not an American citizen <coughs> at that time. So I said, maybe you can do something to get my wife over here. Sure enough, very shortly thereafter, she was asked to come to the consulate in Bombay. She was working across the street from there with Burma Shell. And they asked her, do you still want to go to the United States? She said, oh yes. Her visa, her, her uh, affidavit had expired, but all of a sudden this was washed away. And then the next day she was called, she said, yes, I want, still want to go to the United States. The next day she was called over again, when do you want to go? So she said, well, I have to give notice first. So she did. And after two and a half years, and after having written 117 letters to each other, both of us, uh, she arrived on the 9th of, of, July, of June, 1948, and on the 27th, we became husband and wife, and they lived happily ever after. 
And, and, the, and the only reason you went two weeks is because you had to go to a wedding in between those two weeks, right? Yes. Yeah, so that was the only reason you delayed <laughs> two right. weeks. That's why it took two weeks. When you came to the United States, you had $10. Is that right? <laughs> yes, I, had t I owned $10. But I had $50, which my friend had given to me to give to his brother. So I had that money available, and I had to use, I had to use it. But eventually, I gave it back to his brother, of course. But the ten dollars, uh, the fellow, the fellow on the ship, it took us exactly one month to come from India to to the United States on the ship. We landed in in New Jersey, and. There was one fellow who always served us food and all that. I felt, I felt I had to give him some tip, so I gave him five bucks to... <laughs> Half your money. Yeah, and then somebody, <clears throat> somebody helped me with my, with my bag. I had, I had a couple of bags. And when I got, when I got on, on, off shore, on shore, I had to give him a tip too, but I had no money. I didn't want to give any money, so I gave him my Toby, my sun helmet. And he was very happy with it. <laughs> Henry, I think um, we, are, we might have time for one or two questions before we close. Is that okay? We'll take one or two questions. And um, we have uh, microphones, one on each side. We ask if you have a question. Wait till you have a microphone. Make your question, please, if you can, as brief as you can. I will repeat it so that Henry and everybody else can hear it, and then he'll respond to your question. Uh, so uh, I, I saw some hands back there. There we go. You said you had changed your name from Heinz to Peter, but now you go by Henry. Okay. So when did you change from Peter to Henry? Henry, you changed your name from Heinz to Peter, but you're Henry today. When did you leave Peter behind? Uh, well, Peter, I didn't... Once I got out of England, I, I didn't call myself Peter anymore. Then, then I called myself Henry. That's all. I mean, it was quite, quite simple. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been Henry ever since. Okay, thank you. Do we, do we have one more? Oh, there we go. We got a couple in the back. Okay. Okay. Henry, you if, mentioned. If you want to ask me any question afterwards, you can come up and. Ask yes, us. yes. Thank you, Henry. Henry's going to stay when we're finished. We're not quite there yet. He will stay up on the stage. And so, anybody who wants to come up and ask him a question, shake his hand or whatever, please know that you're welcome to do that when we finish. So, okay. hold, you, hold those other questions. Henry, you mentioned what you believed happened to your mother. What happened to your father? Henry, you told us what you believe happened to your mother. What do you believe happened to your father? What? what do you believe happened to your father? You told my us father, what? My father, they kept very good records. He was in loss also. And then uh, he got sick, he went to the hospital, and he died there. I don't know exactly what happened, but this is what I was told in the, uh, in the Holocaust Museum, right here. And that was after he was forced into the lodge ghetto. Hmm. He was forced into the lodge ghetto, and there he died in the yes. lodge ghetto, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Now I have a, uh, want to say something. Okay. Right. Wait, wait, is it your last word? Yeah. We're not there yet, quite yet. Oh. Okay. Um, we'll go one more question, then we'll get there. Okay. <laughs> We're almost there. You're punctual. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Henry, for sharing with us. Uh, the question about your father being released after one month. Why do you think he was released after one month from Dachau? The question is, why do you think your father was released after one month he in was Dachau? Not, oh, oh, I see. Why, why was he released? Uh, well, <coughs> lots of people were released at that time. It was just initially to, to give them a shock, I guess, and uh, encourage people to get out of Germany. I don't know why it was, but... Uh, it was it wasn't that terrible yet. It got worse by the day. <clears throat> and, and and Henry used the word encourage. Many of those who were released after Kristallnacht were basically told, "We'll release you, but you have to leave Germany." And so many, of course, tried to find ways to do that. Um, 
I want to remind you that we will have a first person program each Wednesday and Thursday through the middle of August. So hope that you can return and join us at that time. Um, Henry's going to give us his last word in a moment because it's our tradition that our first person has the last word. Um, but I would like you to um, uh, wait until you leave because our photographer Joel is going to come up on the stage and take some video of, um, of Henry with you in the background. So that'll be very exciting for him to have. So please bear with us for that. So as I said, it's our tradition that our first person has the last word. Okay. If you know somebody whom you hate, you have very good reason to hate that person. And do not make the mistake of generalizing. In other words, the same a person with the same background is not necessarily the same type of person. And it's a very important. You see, <coughs> I could hate and I do hate the Nazis, as you can well imagine. <coughs> but if it had <coughs> but it is for Mr. Ege to show you that there were very good people in Germany too. And you do not generalize by saying, well, all the Germans are terrible or stuff like that. And I want you to bear this in mind, whether they're Muslims or whether they're Hindus or whatever. So please, please don't discriminate. Be judicious and take every person the way he is he or she is. Thank you. <laughs>